if they do, Congress does give them more money, should there be any strings attached? My name is Sheila Weinberg. I'm the founder and CEO of Truth in Accounting, a nonprofit organization. We try to educate the public about their government's true financial condition. As a nonprofit, we are always seeking new partners and supporters. So if you're interested in our work, please reach out to us after this webinar. I started Truth in Accounting when I realized that citizens were not being provided the information they need to be knowledgeable participants in their government's financial decisions. You can find more about Truth in Accounting at our website, truthinaccounting.org. And during this quarantine, or what I refer to house arrest, you can have some fun over on our sister website, data-z.org, data-z.org. At this website, you can look up your city and state's financial condition and the financial condition of the federal government and have some fun creating charts, comparing the 75 most populated cities and the 50 states using more than 700 data points. Uh, on our Truth in Accounting website, feel free to scroll down to the bottom of our homepage and sign up for our morning call which comes from Bill Bergman on a daily basis. And it's a summary of all the great state and local budgeting and accounting stories. Today's um, webinar is based upon an article that I co-wrote with today's experts. It was signed by more than 30 other organizations. It's a letter that calls that says, if there's additional federal aid, it should be direct, transparent, fair, and reasonable. Congress is currently in recess, but when they come back, it is expected that they will debate a new aid package, including new aid to the state upon their return. Joining me today is the director of the Finance, Fiscal and Budget Policy Project at R Street Institute, Jonathan Bidlack. He is also the creator of SpendingTracker.org, a real-time spending database, which he continues to run while he's at R Street. Jonathan received a bachelor's degree in economics with minors in finance and political economy from Princeton University. Our other expert is Adam Schuster, the budget and tax research director at the Illinois Policy Institute. In his role, he develops original research solutions and writings regarding state and local government finances. His work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Fox News and the Chicago Tribune. In fact, just last weekend, I read a great article in the Chicago Tribune by Adam. Adam received a master's degree from Northern Illinois University. For today's event, we'll give everybody a chance to ask our experts. You can do that using our Q&A feature. You'll see, not the chat feature, Q&A, you'll see it at the bottom of the Zoom screen. From left to right, you'll see the mute button then the start video, and then question and answers. Just type your question in the box at any point during the event, and we'll try to answer your question. Fortunately, we have a lot of people attending today, so we might not get all, to all your questions, but feel free to contact us after the webinar to get some additional answers. Our format today is uh, Jonathan will uh, provide us with about five minutes of comments, and then Adam will do the same. Then I'll ask a few questions of the gentleman, and then we'll get to your questions. So Jonathan, now go ahead, Ruth. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you, Sheila. I appreciate it. And I uh, uh, really appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk with everyone and uh, hopefully answer all the questions on what is uh, very much a unique time, I think, in our country's history in many ways. And uh, fiscal policy is uh, very much in a unique time as well. We've all seen the charts, I think, of uh, you know the spikes in unemployment and uh, and and, and sort of the, the radical changes in economic variables that I think none of us have ever seen. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a unique in the sense that uh, I think a lot of times people think that fiscal policy, you can just kind of look in the, you know, open up your economics textbook and say, you know, scroll to the page with your problem and then say, you know, how do I, how do I resolve that problem? And, uh, you know, I, I never really, really had a section on, on pandemic response in my economics textbook. And so I think that you know, policymakers and those of us that think about these questions are in many ways flying by the seat of our pants and thinking about, um, you know, what is the appropriate response here? You know, as, as someone who has 
uh, you know, is, is obviously very fiscally conservative and has kind of built my, my own reputation, I guess you could say, as being the, the, the spending guy or the anti-spending guy, you know, it sort of has forced me to rethink a little bit about, you know, what is the appropriate response at, at this point in time? And, you know, so far, I think that the aid that we've seen, is, as we know, there have basically been three packages so far, the CARES Act being the most significant. Um, and, you know, you can sort of think of that aid in, in three buckets. It's, it's aid to individuals, it's aid to uh, uh, corporations, and it's, it's aid to, uh, to the states. And so, you know, we're here obviously today to talk a little bit about uh, the state uh, piece of that. And in many ways, it's, it's, it's kind of the most frustrating. Like when I think about the overall sort of response that we've seen at the federal level, for the most part, I think policymakers have gotten it right. You know, there's there are obviously a lot of quibbles with respect to the size. There are there are certainly portions that uh, that I am not supportive of. Uh, but I think generally speaking, we all recognize that you know we are we are faced with a very unique situation, um, and and you know the lockdowns and sort of the governmental response is also a part of that. And so the question becomes, you know, what is the, you know, how, how do you respond? And and um, you know, I have made this distinction between thinking about relief and stimulus. I think that the you know, a lot of people in the pre popular press sort of talk about the, the government response as stimulus, but we actually don't want to stimulate at all, right? The economy was doing quite well beforehand. State budgets were actually in a really great shape, right? Rainy day funds were in as good of a position as they had ever been in, um, you know, post the 2009 uh, fiscal crisis or financial crisis. And so, uh, you know, we're not really trying to stimulate. What we're trying to do is provide relief in this environment uh, that gets us through what is hopefully a, a relatively temporary problem uh, and then, you know, be able to have the economy and the, and the private sector, um, you know, really uh, uh, start humming again, so to speak. And so in the state context, I mean, the thing that has frustrated me and the thing that I think sort of motivated the letter that, that uh, Sheila mentioned that we all circulated um, is that it's really the only area where people haven't thought about the idea of accountability. So, you know, even if we all agree that there's sort of a, a federal role at this point in time, uh, I think it's also important to acknowledge that we need to have as much transparency and as much accountability as possible. And, you know, obviously it's, it's illegal to, uh, uh, you know, commit unemployment insurance fraud. Uh, you know, there's been a huge push to ensure that the PPP funds that have been provided to private entities have adequate oversight. But in the context of, of state relief so far, uh, it's basically been write a check and hope that the states do the right thing. And so, you know, that is not the, um, it's not the mentality I think that we should have. And it's not um, hopefully what we, the mentality that we will, we will have if there ends up being a, a, a fourth piece to this, uh, to this relief picture. And so, you know, my view is that, uh, you know, we can sort of, there's a, a broader question about whether further state relief is necessary. And I think we'll talk about that a little bit, uh, you know, and we all kind of come in, come in different, uh, come, come down in different positions on that question. But from the standpoint of, of you know, what any future aid, state aid should look like, it, it's, to me, it seems imperative that there needs to be some, some type of accountability. And whether that takes the form of strings or whether that takes the form of increased transparency or how that exactly looks is an open question. But the debate that we should be having, that policymakers should be having in Washington, should be about uh, ensuring that we're not just providing sort of a, a further blank check. And, you know, that becomes particularly important uh, when we start talking about some of these bigger figures, right? I mean, so far, uh, you know, the state aid has been about $150 billion. And obviously there's been other aid that's been run through the states, but, you know, now we're looking at, at proposals that are much larger than that. And so um, the, the, the potential shortfalls of not uh, providing increased transparency and, and providing uh, accountability uh, becomes much greater. And so that's, that's sort of my, my concern. So I uh, hope to talk a little bit more about uh, some of these things, but I guess I will uh, turn it over to, to Adam to, to share his remarks. Well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thanks again to Truth in Accounting and Sheila for hosting the event. Uh, I really approached this uh, from a position of uh, a fiscal watchdog in one of the most fiscally mismanaged states of the nation. I would argue by far the most fiscally mismanaged uh, state in the nation uh, and really got involved in this issue because our Senate president uh, wrote a letter to Congress requesting a, a bailout that would have been about $44 billion. Um, that bailout uh, would have included about $10 billion for pensions. Um, and they were asking for this because as a result of the COVID-19 recession, uh, state and local revenues are dropping precipitously. This is true across the country. Um, and so their, their response wasn't to uh, figure out what they could do on their own to manage their, the budget. It was just to, to hold their hands out to Congress and ask for a blank check. 
Uh, and like Jonathan said, most of the conversation around state and local aid so far has been about how big of a blank check should you write, uh, which I think is exactly the wrong conversation to be having. Um, you know, people have put that number at between 500 billion, uh, as much as a trillion dollars in additional aid that they're going to provide. Um, and we've seen significant aid come already, as again, as Jonathan mentioned, the $150 billion under the CARES Act, uh, $500 billion in uh, lending authority to the Federal Reserve, which has never done this type of lending to state and local governments before. Uh, but there's also a whole t a whole bunch of other aid that, that flows through state and local governments, about $30 billion each for education, for public transit, um, you know, and, and tens of billions of dollars or not, tens of, uh, <laughs> for uh, the hospital system. And when you add all of this up, it's over $500 billion that has already been provided. Um, so the question is, how much should be provided uh, additionally, if any, but also how do we make sure that that money is used for its intended purpose? Because the argument from state and local governments who are requesting this aid, from Democrats who support this aid, is that you need it to avoid cuts to essential services, also tax hikes in the midst of a recession, that these things would make the recession worse. And so there is a little bit of a legitimate argument there, but it, it's not an argument for uh, spending as much as you want or for, for throwing good money after the bad. And in Illinois, that's what you would do. If, if you gave any money, to Illinois politicians without strings attached, without conditioning that aid on some type of significant financial reforms, the money's gonna be squandered. It's not gonna be used to, uh, to fund essential services. It's not gonna stop tax hikes. Taxpayers in the state are gonna continue to suffer under a broken system. And all you'll be doing is propping up the bad spending habits uh, of our politicians who have mismanaged their own finances for decades and are in much worse shape than other states because of their own actions. Um, and so our response has been, if you're going to provide any aid to state and local governments for general budget holes, not disaster relief, not the type of thing that Congress has done so far, because that money cannot be used to cover revenue losses that's already been provided. But if you're actually going to get involved in uh, helping them with, with their budgets, uh, helping them cover revenue shortfalls, then you need to ensure that that money is safeguarded, that it's protected, that it can't be wasted. And so we think that there's three sort of hallmarks of good, uh, good governments, good fiscal policy in states, and that's that they have sound pension funds, they have truly balanced budgets where they end the fiscal year uh, spending uh, at or, uh, or less than their revenues. And finally, that they save uh, sufficiently for rainy day, um, that they have a, an emergency fund that uh, covers revenue losses when there's a recession. And states are all over the map with regard to these. How bad are their pension funds? Um, you know, how, how uh, responsible are their budgets? How much have they saved for rainy day? But there's a few states that really stand out. Uh, Illinois, New Jersey, and Connecticut are by far and away the most mismanaged states just by the numbers. If you look at their total debt burdens compared to the size of their economy, those are the only three states that have a debt to, uh, to GDP ratio of 25% or above. So they're badly mismanaged states in a class of their own. And what they largely share is chronically unbalanced budgets and deeply mismanaged pension systems and a lack of savings for the future. So if Congress is going to help these states with, with what is a real crisis, they need to make sure that these states that are the bad actors that aren't doing the responsible things that many of the other states have been doing, uh, that they actually get their fiscal houses in order. Otherwise, we're just wasting taxpayer money. Uh, well, thank you, Adam and Jonathan. Um, for, for a couple of questions from uh, me, um, Jonathan, um, as, as you guys have mentioned, the CARES Act provides $150 billion of aid to the states. The proposed HEROES Act calls for an additional $915 billion in aid to state and local governments. Uh, you had more than 30 organizations uh, uh, sign this coalition letter that calls for reasonable conditions if the states receive additional aid. Uh, did all of those organizations agree that there should be additional aid? And how much additional aid do you think that there should be given? The good, the good question, the tough question to start with. Uh, so no, we certainly didn't uh, uh, have agreement on, on how much additional aid there should be. Uh, and, you know, I think it's a this is a very tough question. I'll, I'll throw out a couple of stats, though, to, to uh, you know, supplement what, what Adam already shared. If you just look at the balances of those uh, state rainy day funds together with that, that $150 billion that's been directly given to the states, uh, according to estimates from the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, which is not usually known as a fiscally conservative group, they uh, essentially the states already have enough, uh, enough funding uh, to cover any expected shortfalls through fiscal year 2021. 
So it's certainly possible that there will be additional shortfalls going, going forward. Um, it's certainly, we, we should also recognize, of course, that, you know, not every state had their, their rainy day fund in a perfect position post the 2009 um, financial crisis. And so, you know, so far coronavirus has maybe hit different states to differing degrees. So there's, you know, it's not a perfect uh, analogy, but, um, but the idea that we need, you know, an additional trillion dollars beyond what has already been given out uh, is kind of, I think, a little bit ridiculous. Uh, you know, I would argue 500 billion is pretty ridiculous. Um, you know, my view is that if you were, if you were, you know, a business thinking about how would you go and, and, you know, share these sort of scarce resources that exist and increasingly scarce, scarce resources that exist at the federal level, you would want to have, you know, a demonstrated need and be able to say, okay, you know, this state has this particular need and this is exactly how much, how, how they're going to spend that, that funding. Um, unfortunately, that's very difficult to do at the federal level. You know, it tends to be sort of a, um, a blanket proposal that applies to all states. And so um, my view is that our bias should be toward not needing to provide additional funding at, the, at this point. Uh, and to, it, you know, to the extent that we do, uh, you know, targeting it would be the ideal. And short of being able to target it in, in that way, um, some of the things that we mentioned in our letter are what's important. So ensuring that there's that plan up front, ensuring that there's uh, some level of transparency as to where those funds go. So, um, you know, do I have an exact number in mind? No, uh, but I definitely think that the, 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 the bias from my end is toward the lower end of the spectrum. And I think that's probably shared, frankly, by, uh, by most of the organizations that, that, that signed the letter, even if there might be some disagreement over, over what that exact number should look like. Yeah, and I think some of them said there shouldn't be any federal aid, additional federal aid. Is, is that right? That's right. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, some of them were hesitant to sign on to the letter because they <laughs> felt that it implied that we were saying that, you know, this, the federal government definitely should give federal aid to the states. Um, and some of them didn't believe any of them should be done, but they felt there, sh if there was, um, there should be conditions. Um, Adam, what, what do you think, you know, the letter had some conditions. What do you think the uh, top condition should be um, placed on states if they get additional state aid? Federal the aid. top condition uh, has to be pension reform. Um, and that's because when you look at those three states I mentioned, Illinois, New Jersey, Connecticut, by far the largest portion of their total debt burdens is their unfunded pension liabilities. Uh, and if you don't have a sound pension system, meaning that it's on a path to full funding without, you know, absurd level of taxpayer costs, um, pension funds quickly become a black hole of government finance. Uh, if, you know, if you look at Illinois, for example, um, which has the worst pension crisis in the nation, leading to its worst overall financial health in the nation, um, in the 90s, we spent about 4% of our budget on pensions. Uh, today, it's over 25%, has been for several years. And yet uh, the debt burdens continue to grow. It's the largest single item in our general funds budget. Uh, we spend you know, uh, over $10 billion a year on this. Uh, and yet the, the debt continues to grow, the funding ratios don't improve. Um, and in some sense, you know, Illinois has, has become as a state, a pension system with a small social service agency attached to it. Uh, because as this pension debt and the cost of servicing this pension debt has continued to grow, we've seen a continued deterioration in core government services, things like education, public safety, uh, public health programs, um, all of those things. When you combine all of that together, what I, what I call sort of core government services, it's fallen by nearly a third over the last uh, 20 years in, in inflation adjusted terms as pension spending has skyrocketed 500%. Um, so this is very, very dangerous. Uh, it's easy for these, these pension systems to, to run away uh, and become a major problem. And uh, it, if states are not required to make sure that they have sound pensions in place that, that insulate taxpayers from risk, there's no way that we would ever support uh, additional aid to, to state and local governments. Now, if, if I could quickly uh, touch on, on the amount question as well, though, um, we do, you know, I think there is an argument um, for providing relief. And, and I appreciate, you know, Jonathan's uh, distinction between relief and stimulus to state and local governments. $500 billion is way too much. A trillion dollars is certainly way too much. So both the sort of existing legislative proposals out there, I think are ridiculous. They're frankly not, you know, more than in any number. They're not uh, attached to the expected losses and they, they far exceed uh, the amount of losses that, that, that states are actually experiencing. So uh, Moody's, 
uh, which is, you know, very neutral, unbiased group as far as I'm concerned, good, good financial watchdog, uh, found that uh, expected state revenue losses are going to be about $200 billion through fiscal year 2021. They said that without uh, federal assistance, um, states would be forced to, you know, cut uh, to the meat, right, cut to the bone, uh, and actually reduce services that people want and need. And they will also likely increase taxes. Both of these are things that you don't want uh, during a recession. Um, so I looked at the, the number that Moody's came out with, $200 billion, and I said, well, if, if the federal government picked up a little bit more of the tab than they did in the Great Recession, because in the Great Recession, they covered about 40% of losses. If they covered 50% of losses, that'd be about $100 billion to states. And then if you look at local governments, local government revenue collections are typically about 75% of state government revenue collections. So the maximum, the absolute maximum, I think that makes sense is about 175 billion. Um, but again, that's if and only if it's conditioned on these, these uh, sound finan financial management practices and without those strings attached, no, no money at all is, is the right way to go. Yeah, and, uh, and we, oh, go ahead, John. Go ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to piggyback and say that, you know, I think that um, I think that's all all accurate. I think the um, the challenge, of course, is more of a political one than it is sort of a, a policy one um, in that, you know, it's very difficult to get uh, federal legislators to be interested in, you know, state what are seen as state budget concerns. And so, you know, from from my standpoint, I always sort of think about, you know, what's the 80 20 rule, right? Is there something that we can do that gets us 80 percent of what we want? Um, and you know that, that's where I, I go back to the the point I made earlier about about transparency and being uh, to be very specific about that. I think that the um, the, the real value is ensuring that the, that the states uh, are are sort of putting out there online in some sort of reasonable time frame how those funds are being spent. So it's kind of analogous to what we've done with respect to PPP, right? If we're if we're going to provide aid to businesses, there should be some basic information about who those recipients are. Um, and and you know as part of the PPP process, by the way. It's not like you know businesses that, that receive these funds are just able to go and you know fill out a you know a couple questions and and that's it. They have to demonstrate an actual need, and so uh, I think it's reasonable to say that states should have to do the same. That you know demonstrate a need, say what they're going to spend it on, and then show after the fact that they spent it on on what they want and so uh, what what they what they needed to. And so um, you know with with of course the important caveat that the things that they should be spending it on are those things that are directly related to harm caused by by COVID specifically, right? It's, it's very important, I think, here, one thing we haven't touched on so far is, um, you know, it, it's important to make sure that we're not using federal aid to essentially provide a bailout by a back door, right? Like just provide funds to the states that end up being used to, to paper over pre-existing uh, budgetary problems that are unrelated to the pandemic. Uh, you know, again, I, you know, I'll just emphasize, like, I think the, the important word here is relief. We're trying to provide relief very specifically to the harm that's been caused by an, you know, an exogenous shock to the system, the pandemic. Um, and anything beyond that is not really appropriate. Uh, and so then to the degree that we, that we provide that, that, that relief, the question then becomes, how do you ensure accountability? And, and, and that's, of course, what we're, what we're grappling with here today. Yeah, definitely. And, and a truth in accounting, we think you know, the, the audited financial statements uh, for all the states, except for California, have come out for 2019. And we believe that the state aid should be based upon, you know, if there's state aid, it should be based upon those numbers. Because as you mentioned, all of this is unprecedented. Um, but we can go back to actuals and say, you know, if you're going to provide um, relief for lost revenues, compare, you know, do that based upon what revenues they had before um, and what losses they have from there. Um, another question is, um, uh, Jonathan, I, you know, during some of these webinars, um, state and local uh, that I've attended on state and local government finances, uh, government officials, academics, bondholders have highlighted that if the federal government doesn't provide more aid to the state and local governments, then the recession, the overall recession will last longer uh, like it did during the last recession. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I, look, I don't think that's an unreasonable argument uh, in theory, um, but that, that question, um, it doesn't, it doesn't say anything about what the appropriate size of the response is, right? So the reason that aid was provided to the states in the CARES Act was for that exact reason. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily, you know, that aid, right, may end up being more than was necessary to prevent that kind of phenomenon from, from occurring. So, um, you know, look, I'm, what I'm, you know, sort of uh, have a little bit of trepidation about, I guess, is 
providing aid um, in advance when we don't really know what the problem is. So, you know, I mean, look, I mean, states could have a really deep recession in 2024 for all we know. That doesn't mean that, that the federal government should just, you know, suddenly dole out $10 trillion to the states now to ensure that doesn't happen, right? There's a certain, there's a trade-off that takes place there. And so, um, you know, it's not an unreasonable argument. And, and you know, that's, that's frankly, you know, why, why we're in the boat of providing aid uh, to begin with. But the, 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 the crux of that question uh, is really, you know, what is the appropriate size response? And so, you know, you need to have data for that, right? You need to have reasonable expectations and estimates of, of what the, the hardship uh, face really is. And, you know, uh, just to allude back to what I said earlier, I, and, and some of the things that Adam has said, I think it's, you know, it's, it's pretty clear that we've probably gotten that about right. Uh, and so, you know, maybe there's maybe there's room for something additional. I'm certainly always open open to that idea. But uh, for the most part, right now, I think that I think that we have we sort of um, have hit the nail pretty close, you know, to, to on the head. And so, um, you know, you like any decision, you you reassess that as you have further information. But uh, it's not enough in my in my view to just say, well, there could be a further recession, and therefore, you know, we're just going to throw more money at the states. Um, and it certainly is is uh, you know. Um, should that that rationale should not be used to provide a blank check and not uh, have a firm a firm estimate in mind as to why you need uh, a specific amount of aid beyond what has already already been given. Adam, did you have any comments, or should we move on? We, we can move on to the next question. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, and you know, uh, a question from the audience, which is that you know, since money is fungible, if you provide a federal aid um, is given um, and applied responsibly, what keeps um, legislators from just shifting uh, that to other funds uh, to be squandered? Um, can we can we really put any uh, any conditions on that, uh, Adam? So I, I think that is exactly the right question. Um, and that's why we think that the underlying finances of any entity receiving this money need to be sound uh, because money is fungible. Uh, any money you give to Illinois, even if it doesn't go directly to the pension system, even if it's accounted for, for something else, it's offsetting local dollars that otherwise would have gone to the pension system, which frees them up for other spending, right? So based on that, based on that principle, uh, we we wouldn't support giving any money to a, to a, a mismanaged entity without making sure that they're reforming uh, their finances structurally and fundamentally to make sure that they're on a path to health. And this is actually not a extreme idea. Um, in the current debate, this has kind of been painted as an extreme idea. You know, the, the, those on the left who are calling for the, the, the additional trillion dollars are very very clear that they want this money to be unencumbered, no strings attached. They just want free money. Um, but that would be actually the extreme proposal. If you look at uh, financial rescues throughout the world, whether you're talking about uh, government sector, uh, private sector uh, in Europe or in the US, financial rescue packages typically do come with strings attached to make sure that you're fixing the underlying issues that put you in the place where you needed the bailout to begin with. So that was true in Greece uh, after the after the 2010 uh, uh, European debt crisis. They, they were spending more on their pension system as a percentage of their GDP than any other nation in Europe. So when the IMF and uh, the European Union came in to bail them out, they said, if you're going to get money, you need to fix your pension system. And that's exactly what we want Congress to do uh, for Illinois, because without that, I don't really think that there is a way to uh, safeguard the money or prevent it from propping up these legacy mistakes. And I'll just uh, I'll just add to that that that's also a reason for uh, you know having the bias be on the side of of less aid rather than more, right? So so the 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 problem that the commenter mentions, which by the way I saw they said uh, go Tigers, so I'll agree with that. Um, you know, I think that the um, you end up with uh, that becoming a much bigger problem as you dole out large amounts of aid that the states may or may not need, right? So if a state has a, a specific need related to the pandemic and, and you, you limit the aid uh, as much as possible to, to that demonstrated need, um, the, the you know, the idea that it's, again, going to sort of paper over these other problems is, is kind of moot because they have a more immediate need in the, in the short term. Um, but if you start, you know, giving, giving tens of billions of dollars beyond what states actually need for the, for the immediate crisis, um, then, of course, they're going to start going and, and uh, using them toward other things that may be unrelated. And that's sort of the thing that we're, 
um, that we're trying to avoid. Yeah, well, it makes me a little bit nervous that, you know, that we're setting up a really bad precedent here where, you know, this, if there's a recession or a state's having problems, um, they're learning that, oh, well, we can just go to the federal government for aid. Um, and so instead of fixing um, their problems like their pensions, um, you know, and, and have the legislators in Illinois just always believe that, uh, Adam, that, you know, we can be a bad actors, worst comes to worst, we'll just get bailed out by the federal government. Yes, I, I do think, and, and they've made very clear that that's their plan. Their, their plan uh, for the pension system is not a plan. It's to let it go bankrupt, uh, which it's on a path to doing eventually. The question is when, not if. Um, and uh, coronavirus actually brought us very close to that point until markets turned around a little bit more quickly than expected. Um, and, and that's why when, uh, you know, when, when revenue started dropping, when the pandemic hit in March, Illinois was the first state with its hands out to the federal government. We, the letter from our Senate president called for $44 billion in aid, a quarter of that, 10 billion of that, they wanted directly for the state pension system. Um, so they, they, they're, they're shameless about it. Uh, and you know, on top of that, they, you know, you'd think if you were asking uh, for money, if you were asking for aid, you would wanna show that you had first done everything within your own power to fix the problem. They've done the opposite. So the budget that Illinois passed this year after we knew about COVID-19 after the pandemic hit, increased overall spending by about $2.4 billion, gave uh, state workers automatic raises worth about $261 million. Um, and uh, it actually increased spending even over what the governor proposed in February prior to the pandemic. Um, so they did nothing that even other blue state governors are doing like furloughs, uh, canceling pay raises, or at least delaying pay raises. Illinois did none of that. They continued with business as usual and just want federal taxpayers uh, to, to cover their bill, basically. Um, and so that's why, you know, they, they shouldn't get that. They, you know, they, they need to understand that the federal government's not going to bail out the pension system. It's not going to save them from this problem. And if there's going to be any aid at all to help them in sort of a transition way during a crisis, it, it needs to be conditioned on fixing the underlying problems. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned bankruptcy. Um, so one of the questions is, uh, if the states, um, in particular Illinois, Adam, are left to default, or as uh, McConnell said, let them go bankrupt, um, is it appropriate for the entirety of the population to suffer um, with bond losses, tax increases, and cut in expenditures, um, including pensions um, and social services, um, for the misdeeds of its government? I, you know, I think that's a fair question. I, I'll say, you know, first of all, there, there's never been a state bankruptcy. There have been state defaults, but there's never been a state bankruptcy. There's never been a legal provision for states to declare bankruptcy. Uh, they're supposed to be sovereign entities, which means that they're not supposed to be able to go bankrupt. Um, that's, that's always been a little bit of a, a philosophical or legal fiction because, of course, they're subject to the same uh, mathematical rules of finance as every other, uh, you know, entity that there is. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's unlikely to happen in the near term. You know, Mitch McConnell briefly floated the idea of letting states go bankrupt. Uh, it was, you know, did not get support, got, got significant backlash. It does not seem like an idea that, that's um, going to move right now. But I, I would emphasize that uh, when people think about bankruptcy, they shouldn't imagine that a state bankruptcy would look exactly like a corporate bankruptcy or even a municipal bankruptcy. There's a lot of ways Congress could write that law. Uh, and I've seen some really innovative proposals from other people out there. Uh, there's a guy named Richard Porter, who's the Illinois Republican uh, National Committeeman. He's also a bankruptcy attorney. Um, and there's ideas that they could do uh, sort of something short of a, a full-on bankruptcy proceeding like you would see with, like you saw in Detroit and, you know, maybe allowed, you know, it, it's a, a targeted bankruptcy to allow them to restructure pension debt, for example, or something like that. So these are ideas that, uh, you know, are out there. Um, and I, I don't think uh, we should be expecting that to happen anytime soon. Um, but uh, I, I also don't think people should be as scared of the D word as, as they are sometimes. Yeah, I think that's I think that's accurate. I'll uh, I'll just add a couple points to that. The, the the biggest problem is definitely not having a process for it. So, um, in theory, right? I think it's it's reasonable to say that states could uh, could declare bankruptcy. There just needs to be some sort of formal process. Um, it's very hard to sort of imagine, you know, Congress crafting a good uh, a good process to do that, especially in the current sort of um, uh, you know crisis that we're in. And so. Uh, I'm a little bit personally skeptical of that. Now, 
obviously there are huge, uh, there's huge potential for moral hazard anytime you have, you know, uh, the feds providing funds to the states um, that we're, that, you know, we're theoretically trying to protect against. And so the real question is, you know, what is the, what is the best way to minimize that, that moral hazard? And it may be that, that, you know, a formal bankruptcy process is, is the answer there. Um, the other point I'll make is that, you know, states, most states do still have the ability to borrow in the private markets. Um, you know, the Fed has set up a new lending facility for the, for the explicit purchase of, uh, of municipal debt. Um, and so, um, you know, look, there are other options out there, frankly, as well, that are available to states that, uh, you know, go beyond sort of the, the need for direct, direct federal aid. Um, and so, you know, I, uh, I mean, I think the, the bankruptcy question is a very, is a very tricky one. And, and it's, and, you know, anytime you have something that is unprecedented, as Adam said, it's very hard to know exactly how that's gonna, uh, how that would look. And I, uh, I think this is some, an, an area where uh, policymakers need to kind of do the hard work to ensure that, um, you know, there would be a process like that. And, and to avoid some of the potential for moral hazard in the future, I think it's worth their while to do so. I just don't know that it's necessarily the best solution at this moment in time for the, the, the sort of problems that we're facing right at this moment. And I think, you know, as Adam alluded to, I think most policymakers probably feel the same because there really hasn't been a whole lot of movement on this idea at the moment. Now, you mentioned the Federal Reserve. I found it interesting. Our research director, Bill Bergman, um, who used to work for the Federal Reserve of Chicago, um, has been doing research on these, um, the Federal Reserve uh, lending uh, money to the states and has, you know, found that um, in order to do that, according to um, Federal Reserve rules, um, they really have to certify that they're in, that they're not insolvent. Um, so we, at, you know, FOIA and ask, you know, the governor if he thinks that, you know, that if he's certifying that the state's not insolvent. Um, and uh, they came back and said, well, we're not in bankruptcy court, so we, we can't be insolvent. <laughs> um, uh, Another question for Jonathan. Uh, somebody wanted you to elaborate on the suggestions for uh, transparency. Uh, SEC Chair uh, Jay Clayton has been talking about the possibility of the government bond issuers providing interim financial reports, uh, maybe quarterly. Is that the type of uh, transparency that uh, you are looking for? Yeah, I mean, I'm always in the in the camp of sort of all of the above. Uh, you know, there's no, uh, there's generally speaking, no transparency that's bad transparency. And so, um, you know, I'll just harken back to a couple of things I said earlier. I mean, one is I think there's value to having that plan up front and saying this is how we anticipate spending this money. So when you talk about you know funds being fungible and and being able to be put toward other things, uh, you know, presumably no state's going to put on their plan, you know. Uh, X billion dollars to plug our state pension uh, hole. And so, uh, you know, that at least kind of helps, I think, on the front end. And then the other point is just being explicit about where the where the funding is coming from uh, uh, is, is being spent after the fact. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's not unreasonable to, to have states put that aid up on, uh, you know, to, to put how they've actually spent it on on a website. Some states already have um, I think that's a reasonable expectation. Is it, is it going to get us all of the things that, that we want? Is it going to solve all of the issues that we've talked about? Absolutely not. Um, but it's a, it's a heck of a lot more than we've had so far. Um, and, it, and it moves us in the right direction. And frankly, also would establish the precedent that, um, you know, at any point in the future, uh, states cannot just expect to go and have the federal government provide them with funds uh, without any sort of accountability for those funds whatsoever. And so, you know, that's why I sort of see that as, um, as maybe the low hanging fruit uh, and, and a reasonable first step to start with. And another question is, you know, obviously we're in unprecedented uh, times um, and the problems that the states have uh, regarding pension reform, accounting reform, uh, we've always, at Truth and Accounting, never quite understood um, what we understand, but the public doesn't understand how these states balance their budgets but go into debt at the same time. So maybe they need to fix their accounting. Um, you know, this is all built up over a long, a long period of time. Uh, some of the pension reforms would actually require uh, like states like Illinois to uh, change their constitution perhaps. Um, that, but the states need money uh, this year. Um, how do we handle this, you know, getting over this acute crisis, but um, Adam, um, having the states uh, make those major changes, um, either start doing it now or in the future? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think it also uh, goes to, you know, how do you make sure that the strings are actually enforced? Um, you know, 
we've, uh, at the ONA Policy Institute, I wanna make clear this is not the, the specific program or the letter that each of these groups have endorsed, but our, our plan uh, specifically, uh, we call it the Taxpayer Protection Program. And the idea would be uh, that you, you can authorize a certain amount of aid, say you know $175 billion, for example, as a total amount, but then you don't uh, give out more than actual revenue losses and you give it out on either a monthly or quarterly basis. So you can continue to kind of monitor it and, and decide if the full amount authorizes that actually needed. Um, but the way you structure it uh, to both incentivize the reforms and to make sure that uh, the strings don't get cut is we would do it similar to the pay, pay, uh, excuse me, similar to the paycheck protection program, the taxpayer protection program could be structured as forgivable loans. So the idea here would be that uh, the states have to pay back uh, with interest based on their credit rating and maybe a pretty uh, heavy interest uh, in order to incentivize this, they have to pay back the loans to the federal government unless they meet all these conditions. Now, if they uh, commit to reforming their pension system so that it's sound, um, if they commit towards having truly balanced budgets for the duration of the loan at the very least, and if they commit towards rules for rainy day funds that ensure that they'll have sufficient rainy day savings for the next recession, so we don't make this a new normal where we expect the federal government to come in and bail them out every time, if they can meet those three conditions, then the loan would be forgiven. So it's a very strong financial incentive that also works uh, with our constitutional structure. And we think that if, you know, if, we, if Congress could be convinced to, to pass the program in that form, uh, we could, you know, both uh, make sure that we're we're not deepening the recession, that we're not losing essential services, that we're not hiking taxes during a recession, and make sure that we're not, uh, uh, you know, bailing out legacy mistakes or even propping them up uh, so that they can continue on to the future. And uh, I'll just piggyback on that, uh, you know, I think, and, and emphasize something something else, which is you know, the notion of a rainy day fund is a very important one. Um, you know, I, I began my remarks by sort of talking about the unprecedented, you know, situation that we find ourselves in. Um, but if you think about it, you know, what's really unprecedented is the magnitude, not necessarily the phenomenon, right? Uh, states and, and the U.S. face shocks to the system all the time that were not expected. And, you know, you, you think about things like natural disasters, floods and hurricanes and so on. Um, and, you know, you need to be prepared for these sorts of things. Now, you know, is it is it necessarily um, you know realistic to expect every state to be perfectly prepared for you know some sort of you know a pandemic of this magnitude? Probably not. Um, but but the idea that there there should be sort of an, a focus being placed on on you know essentially state responsibility, right? The the analog of personal responsibility, uh, I think is I think is reasonable here. Uh, and and the whole key with, with with you know rainy day funds, the reason rainy day funds are particularly valuable is because of that flexibility that's inherent into them, right? We see this we see this problem at the federal level all the time. I mean, for example, uh, you know we we appropriate you know seven hundred fifty billion dollars a year to the Defense Department. Um, and, and, you know, with the goal of, of theoretically preventing against sort of an existential national security crisis. And the problem we found is that, well, maybe we may have overinvested there relative to other potential existential crises that could have could have impacted us. And so, um, you know, the problem with that model is that it requires you to have sort of that foresight up front. And you may very well be wrong. There are, un, you know, unintended things that come up, unexpected things that come up all the time. And so, um, you know, that's why I think that the, the idea of a rainy day fund is so powerful and why it's so important to sort of preserve and frankly expand um, in much the same way that, you know, all of us in our own personal lives, right? We, we, you don't just go and you try not to live paycheck to paycheck. You try to maintain savings, you know, yes, as, as a way of planning for the future, but also to plan very specifically for um, hardship that may come up in your lives that you didn't otherwise expect. And so, um, you know, when we, when we think about, you know, coming out of this current situation and what changes need to be made going forward, a big thing that I think hasn't been talked about enough uh, is how we ensure that these sort of emergencies, whatever they may be, be it pandemic, natural disaster, national security related, whatever, um, are able to sort of be accounted for in whatever solution we put in place. And, you know, at the states, uh, at the state level, um, I think that, that rainy day funds are a very important part of that conversation. And actually, if I could just add on uh, quickly to that too, because I, I really like uh, the theme with, with rainy day funds here. And I think that, you know, making sure states have good rainy day funds uh, is, is going to be critical to making sure that uh, bailouts aren't the new normal for every recession. 
Um, most states are actually doing really well on this issue. Uh, there's been market improvement uh, in the administration of rainy day funds since the Great Recession uh, in 2009. States were not well prepared. Uh, most states spent the last decade, which was you know one of the longest economic expansions on, on in, in record with, with very high stock market returns and all the rest. Um, most of the states uh, spent the time you know shoring up their finances and putting aside money for for uh, you know disasters and, and the like. So the median state had about 8% of its budget saved before this crisis started. Experts generally recommend between 5 and 10% of your, of your budget saved in a rainy day fund. Illinois had 0%. It was you know, less than $100,000. Uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey also had very low amounts in the rainy day funds. So I, I think one of the things we should be thinking about uh, with these conditions as well is making sure that they don't impose undue burdens on uh, well-managed states, but that they do, uh, or which, which is the vast majority of states, but that they're really sort of tailored towards the, these few bad actors who have not been doing uh, the responsible things that most states have been doing. Yeah, the, the concern I've had about the rainy day funds, yes, they are good things. And yes, the states should be um, prepared for, uh, for a rainy day, for a pandemic or, or, you know, this, as you mentioned, is a huge uh, pr problem that usually doesn't occur, but we have quote crisis um, about every seven years um, and states, some states are better prepared. Um, the issue I've had with these is for example, California before the crisis was touting that it had a very large rainy day fund, um, but they had $250 billion in you know pension and the retiree healthcare and other debt. Um, it's kind of like me highlighting how much money I have in my savings account um, and failing to mention that I have hundreds of thousands of dollars on my credit cards. Um, so um, I think we need to look at whether, it, you know, and, and also just the psyche that, oh, we have a rainy day fund, we must be well financed. I, I get nervous about that also. Uh, another question for, um, for Adam is, Illinois passed the latest budget counting on, counting, uh, on money from the federal government to balance it. Um, what's the likelihood uh, Illinois will get the relief that it needs to uh, help with its day-to-day -day expenses? Well, um, yes. So Illinois uh, passed the budget that, like I said, increased spending uh, by quite a bit uh, and had a, a roughly $6 billion deficit. Um, now, the way that they sort of accounted for that deficit, and it doesn't even fully account for it, is they authorized $5 billion in lending uh, authority so that Illinois could borrow from, from the Federal Reserve. The state's already borrowed 1.2 billion from the Federal Reserve that was used uh, towards paying down the state's bill backlog. Um, and they're, they're, they could borrow up to $5 billion more uh, under the law. Now, what's the likelihood, but they, they hope they don't have to. So the, the stated preference of, of our governor and lawmakers was that they don't have to rely on that borrowing authority because they want $5 billion or more from the federal government uh, to cover this hole. Now, uh, as for the likelihood, I think that's a, a really tough question. Um, you know, this, the, the idea of, of giving more aid to state and local governments has been a priority for the House, uh, Democrats in the House, Nancy Pelosi in particular. Um, Republicans in the Senate have been uh, resistant for the most part, uh, although there is a Senate proposal for $500 billion um, that, uh, that has some bipartisan support. Uh, Republicans like Susan Collins, Bill Cassidy have signed on to that. Uh, so I, I think I would say overall, there, there's still a good likelihood that more money is coming. Um, and because of that, you know, part, part of this, uh, this plan that we've developed is just recognizing the political reality that the House uh, has made this a priority, um, that they're likely to, to hold up any package that doesn't include some form of state and local government aid. Uh, and so we, we saw early on that, the, that the, the right way to attack this wasn't to try to stop all state and local aid, which, which might be a, a losing battle ultimately, but to make sure that it's got some, some good conditions in place, transparency, the type of strings we've talked about, responsibility, all, all the things that are included in the letter. Um, so I, I, I do think it's likely that some will come uh, and we will find out probably within a month or so how much. Um, and Adam, back to Illinois, because uh, I assume a lot of our audience members is, are from Illinois, and Illinois is a unique uh, situation. Um, if Illinois does receive additional federal aid, uh, would we still need to pass a progressive tax to balance the budget as is being argued? 
we shouldn't pass the progressive tax one way or the other uh, is my position, uh, which might not be surprising uh, to those of you who are familiar with me. Um, the progressive income tax uh, is not a, a long-term solution to state finances. It, it really would be doubling down on the same failed strategy of the last decade, which is to hike taxes and do nothing about our spending or debt levels. Uh, we have to remember we hiked taxes, the income tax in 2013. It was supposed to be temporary, um, or sorry, 2011. It was supposed to be temporary. Nothing uh, got really better. The state's debt continued to get worse. Our credit rating continued to drop. Uh, meanwhile, it did massive harm to our economy. It started our out-migration crisis of businesses and residents. Um, they let it expire very briefly, hiked it again in 2017. Tax, uh, you know, uh, state debt burdens, credit ratings has continued to deteriorate since the last income tax hike as well. Uh, what, what Illinois does not need is more revenue. What Illinois does need is pension reform and uh, rules to constrain uh, the budgets uh, and the spending behavior of Springfield politicians. Um, if federal aid comes, I don't think that would, would change anything for those who are pushing for the progressive income tax. Uh, but I would note that um, some have argued, even though they say they didn't, that uh, lawmakers also relied on the progressive income tax in this budget that they just recently passed uh, because it's, it, it covers that, that $1 billion gap between the $5 billion borrowing authority and the $6 billion deficit. And I'll just, uh, I'll add briefly to that, you know, the, the idea of rules uh, at the federal level certainly uh, is appropriate as well as someone who works uh, primarily on, on federal fiscal policy, you know, a big part of the problem that we have, uh, have in Washington specifically is due to the, due to the lack of rules that are effective uh, at, at restraining, um, restraining federal spending. And so, um, you know, states are perhaps in a little bit better situation in this regard, just because, uh, at least most states have a balanced budget requirement. Yes, they can circumvent it. And yes, there are sort of always these caveats, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot better perhaps than, than the federal situation. And I, uh, I do always, uh, you know, my personal view, I, I do get a little hesitant at the idea of, of the feds uh, being solely responsible for uh, the states whipping their budgets into shape just because uh, if you've paid any attention to the federal budget, you know that these are not necessarily uh, uh, the people that you want managing uh, managing more uh, more budgets in the U.S. So uh, it's a tricky, it's a very tricky question. Yeah, and uh, you know the the progressive uh, income tax, um, you know, is is the plan, Adam, that if they get that money, they're they're going to use that to pay the backlog of bills, and also to are they going to put a lot more money into the pension systems uh, under? If they get that money? No. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I don't know if this offer is even still on the table, but pre-pandemic, Governor Pritzker had promised to dedicate about $200 million uh, per year of revenue to the, the pension uh, funds. Uh, from the progressive income tax, it's expected to raise about 3.4 billion annually in the long run. So only 200 million of that total would go towards the pension system, which uh, not only is is an insignificant amount to to make a, a, a any real difference in our debt burden, it's not even enough to keep up with the annual increases in uh, the pension contributions over the next five or ten years or so. Uh, so it would really be, you know. Um, it would, it would, the, the money would primarily be used for sort of general budgetary purposes for the types of programs and spending that Governor Pritzker campaigned on. Uh, he wants to spend a lot more on a whole range of things uh, above and beyond what, what he's been able to increase spending on in his first two budgets. And, you know, Illinois has been fiscally managed. Um, um, the the, uh, the uh, person who asked this question says, because it is deeply corrupt. Um, Hence, Adam, you know, there might be the feds might um, attach strings uh, to the to the money, but maybe uh, what if Illinois just rejects those strings and, and doesn't live up to them? What what would happen uh, in Illinois next? Uh, well, if Illinois rejects the strings, if they don't, they, they either don't take the money or they, they take it and they want to pay back the interest under, you know, the, this uh, plan. Uh, again, it, you know, if, if our plan were implemented exactly as we wrote it, which I, I don't think uh, is likely to happen, but I would love to see it happen, um, then Illinois would either have to pay that money back or they would have to figure out something on their own. Um, and uh, I, I would actually agree, though, with, with the statement about corruption. I think that there, there are two types of corruption. Uh, there's uh, sort of legal corruption, um, which, which is uh, immoral and wrong, even if it's not against the law. And then there's, you know, actual uh, prosecutable corruption. Illinois has plenty of both. Yeah, and um, Adam, I think you touched on this, but could you uh, even speak on it more of, you know, 
what role do you think you know the federal government should play in incentivizing states uh, to get their fiscal house in order? Should this just be during this time, or should there should this be a usual um, process, uh, or or what? I would like to see this be a one-time thing. I don't. I, I agree with Jonathan. I don't want uh, the federal government to get in the business of micromanaging state finances. Uh, they can't manage their own finances. I don't want uh, to put the expectation that they're gonna manage anybody else's. Um, and, and I frankly believe that most of these decisions for the most part should be made uh, locally. Um, you know, we have a federal system, we have laboratories of democracy. It's good to let uh, local politicians and local voters decide what's right for them for the most part, uh, but I don't, see this the type of strings we want to attach as as micromanaging finances or really you know saying anything about uh discretionary fiscal choices that states can make it's just saying you need to have credit conditions in place right like the bank's not going to loan you money if you have uh two hundred thousand dollars in credit card debt and, and a house that's way more expensive than you can afford and all the like um these, these are credit conditions that if, if these states want money from the federal government they need to uh have reasonable uh, ways to demonstrate that their finances are sound. Uh, and so I would like this to be a one-time thing. And if it was uh, effectively done as a one-time thing, then uh, state finances would be in a better position going into the next recession. And hopefully we wouldn't even have to have this conversation. Yeah, and there are, and there are two fundamental uh, related questions, but they are different questions, which is again, what do you do this time versus how do you how do you solve the broader uh, budgetary problems that states are that states are facing, right? I don't think anyone thinks that there's anything that you can do at this point in time that's going to go and you know resolve Illinois or Connecticut's or New Jersey's existing budgetary problems. Uh, so the the question is, how do you ensure that the aid that you're providing, the relief you're providing at this point in time? Uh, is not being sort of wasted or spent in a way that's that's inappropriate relative to the problem that we're facing. That is a somewhat separate question from the idea of how do we actually fix pension funds, rainy day fund issues, or whatever other uh, state uh, fiscal problems may exist. And so, uh, you know, the the reality is that the federal government uh, is is never going to be be the one to ensure that that that, that is fixed. Uh, and and I would argue, nor nor should they. You know, those those questions still come down to uh, you know states and localities ultimately. Um, being committed to getting their own fiscal houses in order. Um, but that doesn't mean that at this moment in time, to the degree that the federal government is providing aid to the states, that it's not appropriate to figure out what the, what the best sort of, um, you know, the best regime for ensuring that those funds are not wasted is. You know, you'd certainly want the federal government to be thinking about that question. Yeah, and, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, the federal government, as you mentioned, they're not great at managing their money. And, you know, our, our debt clock is spinning at, you know, more than a hundred, you know, tr trillion dollars, almost $200 trillion. And, and to have them, uh, you know, be the <laughs> Congress being decide how the state should run um, is, is a problem. Um, so, you know, I want to, I think we're at the, at the end, I want to thank everyone for attending this and all of the great questions. And as I said, if you want to reach out to us afterwards, if we didn't get, get to your question, feel free to. Um, to learn more about uh, future webinars uh, that we will be holding, uh, go to our truthandaccounting.org website or our data-z.org site, web, um, website. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, uh, for, for your insight on this. And Adam, uh, we were honored to join you in uh, providing a letter to um, the leadership of Congress to ask for conditions um, instead of just a blank check to uh, the state governments. And uh, feel free to, uh, so thanks again, everybody stay safe and uh, I hope your house arrest is going well. Mm -hmm.